So a little bit about us, I'm Brian Demers. Been in QA for mostly uh, 14 years now. Currently a uh, QA manager at Premier Blue Cross and I'm managing a team of about 16 test engineers. Paul Holland is a software test consultant and teacher. Over 16 years of hands-on testing and test management experience and an evangelist of rapid software testing. So a little bit about the organization that we're talking about. I work for Premier Blue Cross in Seattle, Washington. It serves about 1.5 million people from individuals and families to Fortune 100 employer groups. Our mission is to provide peace of mind to our members about their health care coverage. And our vision is that we are the health plan of choice and standard of excellence in our region. We mostly cover Washington, Oregon, and Alaska. A little bit about the QA organization. We have 78 full-time testers and SDETs on staff. Um, also augmenting that's roughly five to 20 contractors at any given time. We have seven QA managers, one director, and a majority of our QA leadership is relatively new within the last four years. Um, they're also very supportive of this move that we've been making to rapid software testing, and we appreciate that support. So a little about the climate. I started at Primera in 2010, <clears throat> in September. When I came into that organization, I was hearing quite a few things from the team that I had. One of, them, one of the things was we were spending more time documenting what we were going to test and what we tested than actually testing itself. We also had a lot of items that were ready for tests, meaning the development was already complete on them, and they just sat there for months at a time waiting for QA to pick them up and actually do the test effort against. We also were focusing on a lot of metrics that we've been hearing uh, quite a bit of discussion about, um, and reporting to upper management those metrics like test pass-fail rates that had a lot to do with trying to present something to the management team, but not really anything that we use for managing our organization. So in 2010, 2011, we took an estimate of our testing breakdown of where the tester's time goes. And we were thinking that roughly 15% of our time was actually spent on test execution, and 85% was spent on everything else that we did, documentation, attending meetings, those sorts of things. Another thing that we were showing, speaking of the metrics, we were reporting metrics such as this. So pass-fill rates for our entire QA organization to senior leadership as an operational metric. So like this graph shows, Roughly on average, we were passing 80% of our test cases um, and failing about 20% month over month, year over year. Um, and so we started to look at why are we even running those 80% of those test cases that are passing? So we started to talk about how are we gonna change this in our organization? At the end of 2010, I had a little bit of training budget left after I came on. And so I decided to bring in what we're calling drive-by training. So drive-by training, we defined it as sending a select few to training expect them to become experts overnight, and have them bring that training back into the company and train the non-selected few. Does that sound familiar to anybody out there? Does anybody have to do that for CAS this year? Exactly. <clears throat> After each session of doing the drive-by training, there was a lot of buzz about the good content we were learning, um, but that quickly went away as it was mostly back to business as usual. And so we started to look at what was the problem with this? Did we not have the right engaged testers? We weren't allowing time for them to actually implement that training, or were we not doing good follow through? When we looked in a little bit further, we realized the drive-by training approach is not that efficient, effective for driving mass change, and that we really needed to have all involved in the change, get trained so that everybody starts with the same understanding and exposure. We also historically had sent testers to trainings, but did very little to keep that momentum going once they got back. It was really easy to slip back into the pressures of delivering against releases and tight timelines and slip schedules. And the other key thing is we started to realize this difference between operational and innovative paradigm. And what that really is, um, the Synetics co-founder, Bill Gordon, quoted, the ultimate solutions to problems are rational, but the processes of thinking in them are not. And what that means is it's really difficult to drive innovative change while you're trying to maintain the status quo. And so these are two worlds that we can live in. One is the operational, delivering against releases, having to do tight timelines, and then also trying to allow time for people to do innovation. So what do we do now? How do we actually make some changes against this? In 2012, last year, I attended CAST and I had a lot of good discussion with Paul Holland about our climate. He provided lots of good things to think about, including the possibility to bring in the rapid software testing foundation into Primera. After CAST, I went to the website and read all about CAST, or all about RST, <clears throat> and I realized that that was exactly what we were looking for. So what is RST? Uh, 
so uh, rapid software testing, it's, it's a mindset. It's an approach to software testing. Uh, and after talking with Brian at, uh, at CAS last year, it became clear to me that they needed to change their approach or how they're uh, looking at testing. So it's a mindset and a skill set uh, of approaching testing and let you do it more quickly, less expensively, more effectively in a way that stands up to scrutiny. So uh, it's, uh, it sounded exactly like what they needed. Uh, so the, the primary goal is of the class is to teach you how to test a product when you need to test it right now under conditions that stand up to scrutiny. Uh, sorry, under conditions of uncertainty that stand up to scrutiny. And there's a secondary goal of the class, uh, which is also to teach you to think like a, an expert tester. And if you can do those two things, you can pretty much test in any testing environment. Uh, I'm not going to read through all of these, but these are the themes of rapid software testing uh, and essentially uh, sort of highlight the, the approach. And uh, it's uh, probably the easiest way to describe it is it's a flexible approach uh, to any testing problem uh, that lets you uh, react more quickly to it. So after talking with Paul and actually reading through the content, why was it right for us to bring rapid software testing into Primera? So we had received feedback from the teams that they, did, they didn't know when to stop testing. How do they know when they had done enough testing? Uh, as an organization, we were currently very fear-driven, which is uh, um, pretty much due to the fact that we're an insurance company, which is all about managing risk and being very risk adverse. Um, we also spent more time documenting, planning, and reporting what we were going to be do or have done than the actual testing itself. And as a previous slide, it was like roughly 15% testing, 85% other. Yeah, and I want to point out that that was an estimate when we actually, in the class, we went through, in each, each of the classes I taught, we went through how do you spend your time, and 15% testing uh, was, uh, it, none, of the, none of the classes end up with a number quite that high uh, at, after you broke out how much time you spend doing documentation, meetings, emails, and all that stuff. So, so the other two things that we really liked is it teaches us how to test products when you have to test it right now under conditions of uncertainty in a way that stands up to scrutiny. I think all of us are facing that same testing challenge. It also challenges the team to shift from a scripted tester to a thinking tester and really challenge the findings. So since we decided we wanted to bring it in as a QA management team, how we were going to sell that to our management team. So we set up a vision for what we wanted to look like in 2013, approach to reaching that vision, and the logistics to get there. So our vision for 2013 was to really re-energize re our QA teams. We wanted to provide new techniques that helps ensure we were spending valuable resource time testing the right stuff and at the right depth. We wanted to provide a new and improved toolkit to ensure ITQA is supporting Premier and creating our sustainable healthcare system while minimizing risk and cost to our business and maximizing the value to our partners and members. Who came up with that vision? That thing is wordy. <laughs> that is wordy, it's good. We're selling this to management right now. How do we jumpstart this 2013 vision? History has shown us that bringing in on-site training was the most cost-effective and well-received well training. So we reallocated our 2012 training dollars to bring in rapid software testing on-site and to train all of our 78 associates. So our entire ITQA management team was also in alignment with where we wanted to bring this vision and bring in rapid software testing forward. So the recommendation was we'd bring rapid software testing on-site. We'd have the management team attend at least one of those sessions to gain the understanding they needed and to seek out the engaged. After the training concludes, we would form a sub-team of the engaged to strategize on how we would take primero applicable parts of RST and implement them. And then these would feed our goals for 2013, and approval was given, and so we move forward. So training day happens. So we conducted four sessions, two and a half day sessions each in the late October. So our entire QA organization was included in this training, and each session had a mix of cross-team members and at least one QA manager. Our director also attended at least one session. We ran all these sessions back to back so everybody was trained in a two week period. The elephant in the room. So one of the awesome things about rapid software testing and the trainers that is teaching it is that it quickly makes everyone uncomfortable in the good way. So this brings out what we call the elephants in the room. I'm good at that. You're very good at that. So on the very first day of training, we start hearing people in the room say things like, Am I making you feel uncomfortable? You but actually, know. probably not in a good way though. So. No, you, what do you mean you don't need a test case for every single test we're running? There's things like charters and sessions. What do you mean you can test without requirements by using test oracles? What do you mean that all the metrics we're reporting against don't mean anything about quality, like our test case metrics and the bug reports that we were presenting? So the transition, over that two and a half day period, 
the mood changes from, what do you mean you don't have to, to I'm starting to see how this might actually work in my scenario. And you actually start to see the thinking testers come out and start asking great questions and challenging thoughts, even Paul's thoughts at times. So post-training, after we had the training, so going into November, we were all trained, so what are we going to do now? So we reverted to the thing of going corporate. So in December and January, we conducted what we call a keep, stop, start session with each group that went through RST looking for what they wanted to change in our department. And so what the session is, is you essentially have three boards. One says keep, one says stop, one says start. And you actually start throwing out ideas of what are the things you want to keep doing in our organization, what do you want to stop doing, and what are the things that you want to keep doing, start doing, stop doing. Yeah, actually, I'm, I'm just going to interrupt you right now. Up until now, it's uh, it's been like set up. This this is kind of where the story starts. As the decision was made to transform, everyone was trained, and now it's the story. Uh, and it's not all a happy story. Uh, we hope it's going to have a happy ending. But there was definitely some issues that Primera faced. Uh, Going corporate, you may have guessed, may not have been the correct thing to do. But anyway, we're, we're going to go through everything <laughs> here. But I, I just want to point out that uh, we've been going really quickly up until now, just trying to get to now. Now is the uh, what happened after the training part, which is where a lot of the lessons are. So uh, doing that keep, stop, start session, we actually started to see some pretty common themes of feedback. So our, our organization really wanted to have, look at how do we actually implement RST and exploratory testing. How do we look at bringing in more agile testing approaches, standardizing some tool sets, and standardizing our processes? So with that, we created some formal goals for all of our QA associates. The first one was, for 2013, implement contemporary testing techniques and disciplines per plan, and demonstrate the application of rapid software testing fundamentals such as heuristic testing, exploratory testing, session-based testing, charters, and testing debriefs. Innovation out and the operation in. So I talked about living in between these two worlds. The beginning of 2013, we hit the innovation versus operational paradigm. Work started picking up, projects started getting planned, and the release pressures compressed our testing schedules. Momentum appeared to be slowing on RST, and we were reverting to historical approaches. We created a work group of the engaged and started meeting about how do we actually implement RST. A big chunk of that focus initially was on creating standard charters and session templates. We started talking about how we can actually create these right out of the gate in an automated fashion in QC and TFS. This went on for a few months until management rethought our approach. So the RST intervention. So we realized the work groups we formed were actually creating a top-down approach to implementing RST, which is very against where we were trying to bring this. Our vision with RST would be spread this through a grassroots approach. Our whole premise into why we did not want to do a drive-by training and actually train the entire organization as a whole. We wanted organic growth of our effort. We then went outside the work group for a reality check. We asked the entire department to share, what have you been doing to embrace and utilize RST? This is when we had an aha moment. While we were behind closed doors trying to find out how they formally implement RST, we actually had an elite group of our test team that was already embracing it and doing it organically. So here are some of the testimonials we got back from them. A few weeks ago, each of the SOA QA testers was asked to incorporate some type of rapid software testing into their sprint work. There were no guidelines, no constraints, no formal processes or templates. The testers were just asked to try out some of the concepts they learned during the training we received from Paul last November. One of the testimonials we got back. RST was valuable to me and to the project effort, as it uncovered defects that would not have been discovered during our testing phase if we were just to follow our scripted test cases. I will absolutely apply exploratory testing and wrapper software techniques again in the future. Another one, the training from Paul gave me a foundational idea of how to implement RST. The most interesting thing to me in this process was finding a defect even when I wasn't looking for it. It was a priority three defect that I would probably not have found without exploratory testing. In the future, I definitely plan to use exploratory testing when it is appropriate and I'll be more deliberate in scheduling time specifically for this type of effort. As a tester, exploratory testing is a great way to learn the system versus just hunting defects. Another testimony we got kind of laid out some pros, cons, and lessons learned that they had been uh, experiencing by trying to implement some of this. So the pros were it allowed the tester to think more of what could go wrong and find not so obvious defects. It gave us a chance to reduce the time spent on documenting and increase time spent on exploring and debugging. Some of the cons, 
It was challenging for testers that are used to following strictly the requirements and writing scripted test cases. It was also challenging to come up with a universally accepted standard template that is easy to audit. So some of the lessons learned, use with caution, but for testing tasks with clear and detailed requirements, sometimes it might be better to apply a traditional old-fashioned approach, but RST is a great for projects with vague requirements or better yet, no requirements at all, which are probably the majority of the projects that we're working on. So what's next? So one of the key things that we were hoping to do with RST is fixing a core issue of, we were actually spending way more time documenting what we we're going to test and on what was tested than actually testing itself. Issue is how do you actually measure this subjectively? So a few weeks ago, when Paul and I were talking about this talk, I dis uh, he discussed a great idea for capturing data on this. Okay, so uh, as, as Brian was saying, they, uh, I'm gonna back up a little bit because I, I think you breezed over a little too much what the, uh, one of the main issues that they faced was trying to formalize the implementation from the top down level. I know he mentioned it, but it was causing resistance amongst the, those who were used to doing it in a certain way, but uh, also resistance of people who wanted to try it in, in the way that I had taught them, but it wasn't, what I had taught them was essentially to adapt the method to the current situation, and they were trying to put a framework around that that made it less adaptable, which made it less uh, adoptable, and then, uh, so people stopped trying to do it, except for the, the test ninjas uh, who were uh, actually still doing it anyway. So, uh, <coughs> when Brian and I uh, spoke uh, the first time about doing this presentation, it was quite a few months ago, like probably three months ago, and that was when you'd realized that the, the management pressure was, was stifling the implementation uh, and that uh, they had decided to back off on that and just sort of let them do more what they wanted to do. And then when we spoke just a, a couple of weeks ago, uh, I think you said that you had about half of the team was still doing, on older projects, still doing the, uh, the factory school of testing and about half of the team were doing uh, rapid software testing. Uh, and the, one of the benefits that, that, that they had sold it on was that they were gonna spend more time actually testing. So if we completely ignore the argument that uh, rapid software testing is likely gonna be more efficient, but we just for argument's sake, it's the, it's the same efficiency as, as the old scripted testing when you're actually executing and, and testing, the, testing the product, if we can show that we have an increase in the hours spent testing because we're doing less formal uh, documentation, uh, then assuming the argument that they're the same efficiency, we can actually say, look, we have an X percentage increase in the time we're spending testing, so that is an improvement over the other one. Com again, completely ignoring the fact that uh, you are likely gonna find more bugs more quickly. So I was trying really hard to think, well, how can we measure that? And so I was trying to think of a, of a way that would be an anonymous way of people to, uh, without much overhead at all, allocate the hours that they had. And so my first thought was give everybody 40 marbles. If your team tends to do overtime, you can give them five red marbles as well, which stands for your 40 hour work week uh, and five hours of overtime being the red marbles. And then have multiple containers, one for like leisure, uh, so if your eight hour day includes lunch and breaks, then you drop, if you take an hour lunch and two 15 minute breaks, you drop one and a half marbles. Uh, it's not gonna be precise, uh, but, but you drop uh, seven marbles in for, for leisure or break. If you're a smoker, you drop in like 15. Uh, uh, and then you have one for meetings, emails, that type of uh, sort of corporate uh, uh, communication, phone calls. Another one for documentation. So everything to do with documentation. Creating it, reviewing it, maintaining it, uh, checking it in, edits, uh, meetings, about all of that. So uh, you have that bucket. You have one for bug investigation. So that you're not testing when you're investigating a bug. You've already done the testing up to the point that you found the bug. And then when you're investigating the bug and writing the bug report and doing the retest and everything else about that, uh, that's, uh, we put that into a bug uh, bucket. And then you have your testing bucket. Did you have any others? Uh, was that the, the ones you had? We came up with these. So we had documentation email, meetings, setup, defect analysis. And other, I missed other. And oh. other. 
So, and, and other, oh, that's right, I, and I suggested other because you never know, there may be something that you do in the week that doesn't fit into those buckets. So um, that was what I suggested uh, Brian did, and uh, unfortunately, the suggestion was made two weeks ago. So the good news is we have a week of data. The bad news is it's one week of data, which, of course, makes it statistically completely valid. At least for this presentation, yes. For this presentation. Uh, so, oh, colors. Colors, nice. Very nice. That wasn't in the deck yesterday. No. Nice. So we, got, we pulled some prelim, prelim results. Um, we collected data all last week for all of our teams. So what we're actually seeing is, uh, in the one week of data that we've collected, a 33% increase in our test execution over our pre-RST estimates from 2010 and 2011, um, with only one week, like I mentioned. Um, we're, actually, we're expecting this also to grow as RST starts to gain more traction. And so we're starting to see more and more teams starting to look at implementing more and more pieces of the RST model. Yeah. Did you split out the, is this, this is the conglomerate of everybody, right? This is the conglomerate of everybody. Right, so half of the people are still doing the, uh, the factory way. So uh, even though it shows a 33% increase, that's only with half the people actually doing the RST, so arguably the people doing RST are showing a 66% increase while the others are probably staying stable. That's a pure guess on my part, but the point is that's likely to, uh, it makes sense if A stays the same, and why wouldn't it? Because factory school testing hasn't changed in 20 years, so why would it change now? And then with half of the team doing uh, rapid software testing, the amount of time spent, the number of hours spent actually testing the product has already gone up 33%, which is how many hours for your organization? In a, you, you gave me that number yesterday. It's, it's probably would be in the 7,000 mark, seven to 8,000. Yeah, hours. Hours, year. across 78 test engineers, yep. Yeah, so that's a little bit more testing. Uh, and again, assuming that the testing is, uh, is uh, just as valid not, uh, or efficient, not more. Correct. So this all, we also put a slide in here just to show where actually the tester's time was going. And so, um, luckily, the highest number is the test execution, so that's good. Um, but yeah, we're also, it, it we're also- It wasn't before. It was not before. Um, we're spending a lot of time um, in documentation and email, um, as well as attending meetings and doing data setup. Good. Yes. So some accomplishments that we think we've gotten uh, from RST. So several teams have implemented exploratory testing techniques throughout the organization without us pushing a top-down approach, which was awesome to see. Teams also continue to experiment with charters and sessions and are making adjustments as needed. We subjectively have lots of evidence um, regarding those testimonials that are showing us that we are getting value of our RST, um, and we think we are spending more time testing based off of our one week of data so far, um, and finding better defects, but we want to make this more objective. Um, so we just started collecting where time is being spent, and we're actually adding defects found using scripted testing methods versus exploratory testing methods. Right. And so I hope John is not in the room right now based off of his last talk. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that was uh, something else based on um, a, a discussion that I'd had with a, a lady who used to be the test director at Nortel. Uh, she uh, actually was kind of creepy. She saw me in the gym. Uh, I had, she walked up to me and said, your name's Paul, right? I had no idea who she was. And I said, yes. She said, your son's name is Evan? I said, yes. And, uh, and she said, you probably don't remember me, but your, my son is 15. She said, when your son was three, he was in a Jimboree play playgroup with my daughter. Okay, and you remember my name. I'm freaked out. Anyway, uh, but, but she just has a really good memory, kind of like the Mo Michael Bolton type memory that everyone goes, wow, how do you remember that? So, uh, we started talking at the gym because these are the conversations that I have when I'm at a gym. Uh, she was a test director at a former piece of Nortel that had been sold to a company in Texas, and she said she had done a survey. This was at the first conversation I'd had with this lady. Uh, she'd done a survey of over a thousand bugs that her team had raised um, uh, that had been raised because uh, there was a script that had found them because she was uh, th their team did a lot of scripted testing but she didn't think it was the scripts that were finding the bugs. So they analyzed uh, over a thousand bugs that they found over the last year as to whether they were found by the script, in other words, expected result didn't match, or they were found by an observant tester noticing something else while executing the script. They said, oh, hey, there's something else, and then they would find the bug. Uh, and
and she found that 70% uh, of the bugs that they found were found by uh, observant testers and only 30% were found by the scripts. So this goes to if you're outsourcing your testing to non-domain experts uh, who might not be as observant and they uh, execute the script verbatim, you've just lost 70% of the bugs that you could have found and you're uh, possibly only finding 30. Let's assume that they have some other knowledge, so maybe 60% of the bugs aren't gonna be found. So uh, based on a discussion like that, I think is why Brian uh, started to think, okay, counting bugs just on its own isn't overly beneficial because that's uh, fairly easy to be gamed. Not that this one isn't, but at least if you're just being asked, did you find this bug from the script you were executing or did you find it because you were doing an exploratory uh, type of testing outside of it? And so uh, we're hoping in a few months we'll actually have some pretty uh, interesting numbers to, uh, to share with this. A couple more accomplishment, uh, accomplishments. We're starting to redefine the metrics that we report to senior leadership to focus on answering some questions. So is QA helping increase the quality of releases that are being deployed into production? So we're figuring out how we're gonna uh, come up with a metric for that. What is the QA department doing to become more efficient? And how do we show the amount of potential incidents that QA has prevented from moving into production? We've also secured Paul to come back this fall um, uh, for another session of RSD. So we've actually had quite a few new hires due to growth in the organization since last October and a few new actually managers come on. And so we're actually gonna be- um, Open positions. Nice. Open positions. And so Paul's gonna come back in October and make sure that we still keep everybody up to speed on the RST and our implementation of that. And during that time at Primera, I'm gonna be there the whole week. And one of my goals is to get QA out of their titles. Because you don't assure the quality of anything. You're testers. You're not, you're quality assistants. It's not about the title. Nah. Yeah. So we do have open <laughs> positions if anybody wants to work in Seattle. We have a couple open positions. It'd be good to start before October if you want to go through an RST session. Hey, free RST session and a job. That's right. Perfect. Open That's season it. time. Where's Chris? The facilitator's currently in the middle of the room. There'll be a brief pause. Oh, actually, you're going to need this mic. Number 91. Wow. Lock screen, camera, camera. Second. He's a director. Were, were, were you here for the tutorial on the, uh, on the cards? Green is new question. Yellow is, I have a question on the same topic that's being discussed. So yellow kind of doesn't work. That, that was a uh, board, board member, Keith Klein, who wasn't holding up the right color. <laughs> oh, now he's gone to red. Nice. <laughs> now I want to speak. Sorry, you good? You done? <laughs> so in, in terms of uh, reducing documentation, um, what sort of paranoia and consternation did you get about satisfying various um, auditory and, and, and uh, regulatory bodies and uh, how did you overcome that? So that, that's something we were actively dealing with. So we are actually um, still using, oops, I'm about to tip this over. The um, so we're doing session charter still, like in Notepad, um, and attaching those as our results. Um, or even if we're doing any sort of handwritten type of uh, results, we'll scan those in and attach those to our main source system, which is TFS for our test result summaries. So it's essentially session-based test notes. Uh, for those of you who don't know what session-based test notes are, essentially uh, there's various levels and details you can put in it, but a session-based test note, if you're doing a session, uh, a testing period of time uninterrupted of testing where you focus on one objective called a charter. Uh, as you're testing, you can take notes uh, of what you've actually tested and in a heavily scripted environment, uh, oftentimes the management want some sort of comfort, like a hug, uh, that, that they can go back and check. So uh, if the tester takes 
not incredibly detailed notes, but sort of a highish level notes as to the steps that they followed, uh, that, that can be used to, uh, to appease the management who want to have uh, the ability to recreate tests or uh, some sort of recreation, even though the script, so essentially you're writing a, a high level vague script as you execute instead of before you execute. Right, so I, I guess my, my question is, is really, was, was that readily accepted? I, I've uh, worked in similar situations and tried similar things and uh, had management that found uh, a wall of text to be too confronting because they couldn't see the quality. Yeah, our, our, uh, our management team is very much in support of this shift. Um, that the, the two that was shift. Yes, that's right. The, the, two organiza the two groups that we really are working with to make sure that it is going to be okay is our internal audit team. So make sure we're following our internal processes. So we've already worked with them to, to, to let them know what we're doing and they're on board with that. We're currently going through our SOX compliant audit. And so we're going to be working with our external auditors to make sure that we're all on the same page of what these results are going to look like and that that's going to be an acceptable format. Great question. Yeah, I, I think the big benefit was that from the QA director, yep. the test direct, you got me saying it now, the test director and the test managers were all on board before I started, which uh, is definitely going to help. And once you go above a test director, really, who looks at your test cases? Actually, I doubt she ever looks at your test case either. <laughs> so. Um, do you have testers who are reluctant to change and kind of clinging to the old ways, the factory ways? And if so, how are you dealing with that? How are you firing them? Yeah. <laughs> oh, we're being recorded. Okay. Yeah, so I didn't say that. The um, we actually have a pretty good level of interest in our organization to shift to this. And I think the big thing is, is there's this support from the top down in our organization to really look at becoming more lean and really cutting out waste. And so a lot of our discussions with our teams have been about what are the things that you're doing every day that you don't think are adding value, right? And a lot of them are some of those historical ways of writing test scripts or taking requirements documents that are maybe managed in Word or SharePoint site and importing those into our quality center just so we can have some sort of uh, thought that we're actually doing a uh, coverage matrix, even though we're not ever reporting against that data. And so when you start talking through it with people and, and really understanding and having them see that they're actually some of these things that they're doing that aren't adding any value and it's actually, it's more fun to do the testing piece than it is to do all this documentation and boring work, we're seeing that shift pretty good. Yeah, and actually when, as, as I instructed the, the class, I was uh, quite pleased at the engagement level of, of the group. It was obvious that uh, the vast majority of them wanted to be there and were tired of the documentation. Now, you had an excessive amount of documentation, so I could understand being tired by it, but th there was a, a, a willingness to not have to do that and actually have more time spent testing. So it, it, it hasn't been as hard as you might imagine. Fun watching Chris run back and forth. So, Paul, up to this point, every time I see anyone mention metrics, I see you shudder. Um, <laughs> and, and one of the slides talked about the fact that uh, you're actually looking at, you know, how can we put some measurements in place that help communicate the progress and the, the wins that come from doing this. So, just be interested in some of your thoughts around what some of those metrics might look like that wouldn't make you shudder. Um. <clears throat> There aren't very many. Um, somebody once asked me, actually it was at CAS three years ago, I think I did the, uh, the lightning talk. It's on YouTube, it's 40 minutes long. It's not a lightning talk. It ended up being uh, the MC version of between lightning talks because we were on a skit and it doesn't matter. Uh, it was a 40 minute rant I did. Uh, and at the end of that, somebody said, okay, well, you've, all you've done is blast all these metrics and why they're bad. Have you, uh, you know, what do you collect? Uh, or what do you show? And so I said, oh, okay, I'll tell you. And I've actually never seen so many people suddenly grab for their notepads uh, as, oh, he's going to say something. And, and so uh, I can't remember exactly what I said at the time, but it was something along the lines of a list of bugs, not a count of bugs, but I show a list of bugs. Uh, there, I have an argument often where if you have two projects that are very similar and uh, they're roughly in the same phase and one of them has 10 critical bugs open and one has one critical bug open, which one's in better shape? 
And a lot of times people say, well, the one with one critical bug. And I say, no, you don't know that because the one with 10 might have known solutions for everything and they're going to ha have them all checked in. And the one that only has, uh, and those bugs don't happen often, uh, there's all those things to consider. And the other one that just has one, the bug happens all the time and they have no idea how to fix it. And it's gonna, probably going to take weeks to find the root cause. Now, which one's in better shape? Oh, well, the one with 10 criticals. Right. The, the count help you at all? No, the count doesn't help stop counting bugs. It's a stupid metric. So I show a list of bugs. I also describe coverage. Again, it's from a subjective way, roughly uh, you know, talking about each feature area, the sort of the level of coverage we had, Sandy level, things like that. Uh, talk about coverage of risks. Uh, I might show something called the product coverage outline, which has uh, sort of a mind map of the whole product and color coded as to the level of coverage, something like that. So visually you can see. Um, so I mentioned that and I, uh, and I mentioned, um, uh, what was the, there's one other thing. I can't remember the other thing I mentioned, but anyway, someone then pointed out uh, none of those are metrics. Uh, they're all like lists and non metrics. So, uh, at the time, I thought I actually don't know of any metrics that I like, but I have now come up with two that suck less. I'm not going to say they're good, but they suck less. The one uh, that I literally came up with two weeks ago that Brian's trying, how you use your time, uh, which has already been described, so I'm not going to describe that one again. And then the other one, and it replaces that hideousness that, uh, that Brian showed with the green, red candles, pass rate, percentage execution <clears throat> stuff. Uh, what I like showing for that one uh, is a test effort against each feature. So if you have, uh, it's kind of hard to describe verbally, but if you have, uh, let's say, five features that you're testing uh, and you're expecting that you're going to do 10 half days of effort against each feature roughly equally, and then you measure the time spent testing, not the number of test cases, uh, a horrible metric, or pass rate, an even worse metric, uh, but instead the time spent against each of those features, you at least get an idea of the effort spent and the amount of testing that was likely done in that time. So, uh, and you can also see what you ended up with against each feature compared to what it was planned. So in other words, if I plan, uh, whatever I said, 10 half days of effort against five features, then uh, I end up on one of them uh, only doing two or three half days effort and another one because it found some particularly nasty bugs, uh, a much higher effort. You can see where the shift happened and then the, uh, uh, the amount of effort you're planning on spending at the beginning based on the risk then is now substantially different. That's a good discussion point before you ship. Is that a big risk that we didn't test this as much as we thought we were going to? And it, it's a discussion point. But those are really the only two that, that, I, uh, that I measure. But I, I tend to provide uh, in my test report a list of bugs, talk about the coverage and the risks that were addressed. Risks, Did I, that was the one I didn't say, right? Testing <laughs> coverage and risks, uh, and then uh, showing effort against each, each one. That's pretty much what I report on. Did that help? Okay. And I think you might be able to find, uh, 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 testingthoughts.com is my website. I have a, a blog post on bad metrics and I'm gonna be having a follow-up for that hopefully soon on the, what you can do about it, so. Hi there, is RST testing something that someone can go out into the public domain and learn more about or do we have to hire someone to come to our company to train us? Uh, rapid software testing was developed by James Bach, our wonderful Keynotes brother, uh, and Michael Bolton, and I'm the third person who teaches it. Uh, it is taught, tends to be taught in a corporate level, uh, so in other words, corporations ask us to come in like Brian did, and we teach the class. There are some public classes that, that are offered occasionally, uh, not very often, although I'm planning on doing one at the end of October in San Francisco. I probably shouldn't have said that, so plugging my own course. But uh, the, if you go to satisfice.com, which is James Bach's website, there's a good description of the course, plus another one called Rapid Testing Intensive, which is more of a hands-on application of, of the theory course. But uh, no, there's no, uh, there is a lot of information on it. If you read James, blo uh, James blog's posts and Michael Bolton's blog posts and my blog posts, uh, you'll see uh, a lot of information. The book called Lessons Learned on Software Testing by Kem Kaner, James Bach, and Brett Petticord uh, really covers uh, the, ma the material at a, 
at, at a high level, a book level. So yes, you can learn a lot more about it, but the course itself is, uh, is an, is an in-person course. So I apologize, I'm gonna be the asshole in the room hmm. uh, because I'm looking at the title of this presentation and I was under the impression that I would walk in and I would learn how to take any idea and present it to my corporation to try and get some buy-in. Is this a marketing session for RSP? Uh, no, that, that wasn't the intention. The intention was to show the, um, the problems that uh, Brian had faced uh, coming along, trying to make it corporate because uh, the approach that, that he had taken, whether it had been rapid software testing or any of the other approaches uh, that, that aren't factory school, so not a certification process like ISTQB or something because that's what they were pretty much doing. So if you took uh, any of the other context-driven offerings out there, and there are a few, uh, that it was the, uh, the stumbling blocks that he faced, trying to make it too formal uh, because the per point of uh, context-driven testing and the, this conference is to uh, sort of highlight these things is that all testing depends on the context. And so that's what we were, we're trying to stress. Uh, Brian made the slides, not me. I probably would have taken out about half of at least of the references to RST, but Brian made the slides. and. Uh, but, oh, sorry, he wants to. And I'll build on that, too. When, when Paul actually came in uh, last October, I actually pitched to him the idea of coming and speaking about our implementation at CAST um, because uh, we'd, we'd be six, seven months into it. We could talk about lessons learned. And so that's where that idea actually came from. So it was not supposed to be a pitch for him, although I would actually highly recommend having him in your organization. Great. Make it worse. Make it worse. <laughs> I'd like to point out also that uh, all of the slides for RST um, and, and the, oh. the tools are available online and can be read through. I, I have done some and found them very useful. Having taken the course, uh, it's much more effective in person. Yeah, and those are all on satisfice.com. Right, and, and actually that's a good point. The slides are there, uh, not the exercise slides because that would kind of give away the exercises, but the slides are there and the appendices are there and the amount of information in the appendices that James and Michael have uh, uh, collected and is very impressive. Matt wants to say something on the same thread. I can tell by his vast arm movements that he's doing. <laughs> so we, we use slightly different rhetoric, um, but I think one of the core things that they presented and presented well was this idea of this, what percentage of our time are we actually testing? And in a traditional organization, following um, the, the, the literature advice of the 1980s for how to do testing, um, when you do that exercise, whether you use beads or whether you, you just think about it or whether you mark the time that they have those the different ways to do it, you often find it's a very, very small percentage of the time we spend testing. The next question is, what can we cut out to spend more time testing? And if you do that, you often find very large percentage of productivity improvements are available, relatively brief, and um, you can just go do that. If you don't, you don't need to hire anyone to do that. Uh, and they told you how to do it. So to be fair, I, I think he did offer a lot that um, uh, we just go execute. Okay. So we have the next two days to figure out how we're gonna make that stick back in our organization. Next. <coughs> Wait. We had a yellow hold up here. Up, hold up. And Michael Larson's has a green card. So. But I think, to, I think to her point, though, you spent a lot of time talking about the actual implementation and how that worked and what happened. That I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, she's talking more about the kind of the context of the cultural shift that was needed and how you went about people started changing their minds about we need to do testing differently. So in a more oh, abstract I, sense, as opposed to awesome. just your selection for the uh, for using RST, ha having gone through <laughs> similar process, <laughs> but about what what was the management ethos? What was its view of testing? How did this right. the impetus for changing testing generically, as opposed to your selection of RST to meet those yeah. needs? I, 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 I think I might have skipped the slide. I felt like I might have skipped one in here. Um, yeah, like when you were when you were brought on, why you were brought on. Like the very beginning, how did you get the management buy-in? Because once you have that, it's a lot easier. How did you get that? Uh, yeah, and I kind of I slightly alluded to one of the beginning slides. So we actually had our, our 
QA management team is actually relatively new to Primera. So the majority of our team is within the last four years. Our director also came on in the last four years. And we, we were trying to make this big shift of having decisions be made at the right level in our organization. So currently- Where did that come from? That, that, that actually came from my leadership team. So our director was awesome at enforcing that and pushing that. Um, she was looking at ways for us to become more efficient, looking at ways for us to actually um, report on what we were doing in non-traditional ways. You know, so a lot of the metrics that we were, we are, were reporting on um, in the last few years, all the way up to our CIO were things about test case pass fail rates, about defects. Um, one of the things that I think I missed, but you guys can get back to the slide here. Okay, one, one thing, one, wait one second. You were brought in. There so, you go. yeah, so that I don't, slide you missed. I think I actually uh, fat fingered this slide. So, uh, so, so the training here, so when we were talking about the drive by training, so in 2010 and 2011, we actually brought in a ton of on site training, but we trained a selected few of people. Uh, we brought in uh, risk based testing, we brought in agile testing, and we brought in a lot of really good classes. We only sent 14 people to each of those classes. And there was a lot of buzz about that. Um, and so when, when, when people got back, but then we fell back into that operational world. And so when we were looking into 2013 and really looking at how do we actually change the organization, we were seeking content. At CAS last year, I talked to a bunch of people in the room about different options of what we could do with our training budget. And we happened to fall on RST because we felt like it lined up to where we were wanting to go from a QA management perspective. Wait, before you talk, I get to talk. That's how it works. Um, uh, something else to consider, and, and this is, I think, key. I, I left a corp, I'd been at Alcatel Lucent and previous companies that were bought by it, but I'd worked at the same company for 17 years, uh, the last 12 as a manager, and I was trying to implement rapid software testing because I had taken it from James in 2003, and uh, when I became a manual uh, a test manager of a, of a manual test team, I'd been an automation test manager. Uh, when I became a, a test manager of a manual test team in 2005, I, I tried to start implementing rapid software testing from a manager level. I had various times, the lowest I had was five people reporting to me, the most I had was 12 people reporting to me, but that was, I was a frontline manager and I was trying to change the organization. And I spent five years trying to change the organization and I finally got it so that my directorship was doing it the right way, but it was a hard five-year struggle. Brian, luckily for him, his entire QA department from uh, Kathy, Kathy, right? Yep. Woo. From Kathy all the way down, bought into, uh, uh, bought into it. Maybe because they were new. Maybe because Brian was is a is a good persuasive personality. One of his roles when he was brought in was to transform the organization. So he was looking at ways of doing it. These were some things that they tried that didn't quite work. And then they had that discussion, but for a few years, they've been trying to get that done. And so that, that's key. And at Barclays, I'm gonna talk about you anyway, Keith. Uh, Keith Klein uh, has 900 testers, roughly 700, nine, uh, many hundred testers, 800 testers under him. But he, many hundred, many, many hundred, eight actually hundred testers under him. Uh, but it was in Singapore where you were in charge of a, a small group of just a few hundred. Uh, that he decided he was in charge, he decided to transform that organization. If the level of buy-in is there at the I'm the decision maker level, it's substantially easier than the slug I went through for five years trying to convince directors. Now you can talk. Did I steal I your thunder? No, you're missing my point. Um, it was the, I, I, you guys are talking about the how. You did it, what I, and I understand in Mike for Barclays, what the cultural shift was to address the need for better testing. Keep the mic For better mind. testing, <laughs> thank you. I'm just loud naturally. But what, that's what I don't get here is what, what happened oh, in what? the organization that gave them the need to address testing? Was that, you, you, that Why were you like, hired? I get the how, how you guys did it, but something it happened that triggered the need to address testing. That's what I think generically is missing, which, which then gives all the context for the decisions yep. you made to gotcha. select RST. Mm -hmm. and is, Bugs in the field. Right? That, yeah. That's 
Does that state it more clearly? Yeah, yep, that's perfect. I think I have an answer to that. So one of the things that our organization did, not just from a testing perspective, but from an organization as a whole, is we established what we called our Horizon 2015 strategy, right? So 2015 is around the corner. We're in the healthcare industry. Everybody knows about Obamacare. We have a serious amount of change in our industry. And so from our very top leadership down, there was this push on, we want to make sure our entire associate base that we have are relentless learners, they're catalysts for change, and that they're driving innovative ideas. And so from the top down, that coupled with the fact that they wanted decisions being made at the right level, it was easy as a test management team to go in and sell, bringing something like RST to make us more efficient. And so, yeah, you're right, the environment was actually primed for it, the door was open and we took the opportunity. So, so the answer is President Obama. Yep, thank you. <laughs> Get ready for 10-1-2014. So uh, 183 on the same topic. Um, so I was wondering one thing that adds Breaking to Breaking all the rules of facilitation. Well done, Chris. <laughs> uh, so uh, anyway, but so one thing that though that seriously is missing from the context is like you obviously weren't doing this in a vacuum. I mean, all the development side wasn't sealed off in a hermetic container. Uh, what was going on with them? How were you interacting with them? How were they responding to your organization uprooting itself? I, I don't know if I'd call it uprooting ourselves. I think it's an evolution that we're making, right? So, I mean, I, I think that our interactions with them, if anything, are getting better um, with this. Um, we're trying, like one of the slides we had at the beginning, there's a, uh, this concept of developers would do their work in a vacuum, we would do ours. Um, and because of that, we were seeing things like there was items that were ready for tests that were three, four, five, sometimes two years in the making. They were sitting on the shelf waiting for us to pick them up. And so by making some of these changes and, and doing some other things within the organization, we've been able to make that gap so we're actually aligned with the development team. And actually, they're seeing a lot more efficiencies with us being able to report defects right after they're done, test developing it or during their development versus months later when that's come and gone. So kind of along the same lines, you know, there's stakeholders throughout the entire organization, you know, as it relates to testing, or even in business, elsewhere in IT, even outside of the, the testing management chain, how did you guys go about communicating to them or you know, getting retraining them? They bring expectations, usually, of a factory mindset uh, of testing, usually. How did you go about dealing with that? I think a big thing that we did, we actually did not have a formal communication plan of this change. So I think a big thing, <laughs> it's a good question. <laughs> they didn't tell anybody. We actually have not told anybody we're doing this change. Uh, so actually, seriously, a lot of the shift that we're doing is organic. I mean, at the end of the day, we're delivering quality releases. How we're actually doing that, how we're making our sausage, the common term you'd hear, is something that we feel like we own and it's not something that is being dictated to us. They have expectations. They have expectations. Wait, wait, no one else had heard them. Yeah, they again. have expectations of certain engagement points, reviews, um, outputs, things of that nature. How did you go about telling them ain't gonna happen? Or not at least not in the same way. Yeah. I, I How think did you stop giving the crappy metrics? So um, that's that's actually currently in progress. Um, <laughs> but one of the things we did, and a, a gentleman over here actually mentioned it, and you mentioned your second metric, which was Let's actually stop measuring the number of test cases that we actually are actually doing for a release and reporting against that. Let's actually break it down into the features and the level of risk against those. We did a major upgrade last year, about a 5,000 testing effort hours. The entire thing we shifted from a reporting perspective, we didn't tell anybody we were doing this. We actually broke all of our testing down into features, um, almost in the, and then even broke that down further into the level of effort we needed to do against that. And at the end of the day, the graph looked the same. There was an execution that we were going against. No one said a word about it. Um, so it wasn't about the test case metric. It was that they wanted to see progress being done. Right, so what, um, uh, what Brian, uh, Brian did there was he took the, the, your typical counting test cases metric, which a test case could last a minute or could last two weeks, yet they all count as one. So he normalized it so that they each um, measurement was just an effort estimate so that you're comparing apple-like objects so uh, that way the graph goes from being a crappy metric to being a good metric or a less crappy metric uh, that uh, pervades the same information 
Okay. How do you how do you replace pass fail? You can't. Uh, anyway, sorry. Okay. So I just want to make sure we get to other people's questions. So I'm going to cut this thread off at this point. Uh, 1996 had a new topic a while ago. 96. Anyone? Okay. Might have been the person who just are getting ready for yeah. lunch. So 188 new topic. We have 10 more minutes, right? Uh, a little bit more than that. Sweet. You got 15 more minutes. Sweet. Just a short rant. Uh, if you hope to change the the, the, the testing, uh, you should ch really change the title. Uh, if you cannot get rid of the QIE title, it's not serious. End. There you go. That's what I've been saying. Get rid of the QA title. I've never been a fan of titles. Titles don't mean anything. It's about what you're doing. And you're so not doing that. <laughs> <laughs> not not. That's actually not anything that's even in our list to care about. Um, I mean, at the end of the day, we are hiring test engineers. They're delivering good. Testing results, not a big deal to me. You could call yourself a sanitation engineer then. I'm right? just trying to embrace the argument discussion we had earlier, so we can talk later. <laughs> yeah, just sorry on the yellow cards. I just want to make sure that we get to the people who've been waiting a long time to do their topics. So 199. They'll come back. If you want to talk to us later, we're going to be around. You can approach us. We're good with that. <laughs> I really like the idea of bucketizing the time. Um, what, how would you prioritize what to attack next? Like, wh what would be your top three things of, you're spending too much time on this, let's get these down and get testing effort and analysis up? It depends. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry, that's the normal context answer, it, it depends. Uh, it, it would seriously uh, depend on where, you're wa where you feel you're wasting your time. If your meetings is, is too high, then look at meetings. If it's email, then look at how you can reduce email. Just, you have to look at how the distribution is and say, until you're happy with what the distribution is, address it until it's what you want it to be. So if they're spending 40% of their time doing email, but that's a requirement, it's beneficial, and it's disseminating information or helping teams and other groups or talking with, the, then you can't do anything about it. But if it's, if it's just fluff that they have to drudge through, then that's what you want to try to deal with, which is why documentation is typically a, a big fat target because most of the documentation in factory schools is fluff. So. Uh, new topic 50. Already covered. Already covered, okay. Uh, new topic 30. Okay. <laughs> Same as what? So on the. <laughs> so, okay. well, previous topic. <laughs> So, so the titles thing is, is important, I think, in that it does communicate, it, I think it does communicate to some degree to others what we're about. And, and furthermore, I think it sets expectations. So if you say quality assurance, people begin expecting that of us, of the, te of the testing team, versus test engineering or, or something other than that, um, you know, that it communicates Here's what you should expect of us. <laughs> I was just gonna say yeah. it could be quality. I'm gonna agent. call on Mr. And Matt back there for a second. Hold on. Oh. It could be a quality agent. Just still QA. If you call it a test engineer, well, in the state of Texas, you'd be arrested. So, like, we could do this all day long, but but I hear your point. It's a good one. I say quality advocate, which allows me to not argue about the title. Of course, I'm a QA. Here's, I'll just have one comment on that. The things that we're addressing here are way more important to me than what our titles are. Um, so, I mean, our focus right now is about, like, how do we actually deliver against testing? How do we make sure we're getting good releases in production? We're supporting our business. That's what it's about to us. 120, new topic. Okay. So you're going to get a chance to talk. Yeah, okay, so I've exhausted all the threads, so we can go ahead and... What's your... 91. It's kind of similar to the, the QA testing title. Um, <laughs> I've tried to make the change. I Two questions. One, I guess titles don't mean anything to you, but how, do you, how are you working on making that change? And Paul, any suggestions of tips of how to make that presentation of... We're not QA, we want to be test, getting that title out of the organization. Get a business card made that says tester or test manager. 
start calling yourself that. Hi, so I, I'm really against titles just because to me a title is just a bunch of words that doesn't matter. I mean, if people are trying to explain to others what you're actually doing, isn't that what your mission statement should be and not your title? Are we having an argument? Yes. <laughs> so, Sounds like a good lightning talk. It no, does. So <laughs> to go back to what Karsten says, said, and I thought you summarized it quite nicely, uh, we don't assure quality, so don't say we assure quality. Uh, quality advocate, quality analyst, quality whatever, but of course as soon as you go to QA, people will think that you're back to assuring it. So I would strongly recommend getting away from that title. But uh, saying it's just words and words uh, don't matter, all words matter. They matter a great deal. That is one of the big fights that James and John uh, and Michael and I guess me uh, lead is that the words that we choose to use matter a lot and the words of our title is part of the words we're choosing to use. And uh, it is a small thing and the industry has called us quality uh, uh, assurance for a long time because it came from uh, manufacturing where you actually were assuring the quality of the thing that went by, but we can't do that. The things we try to test are far too complicated and we can't assure anything. So let's stop saying we do. That's all. Same let's topic. <laughs> what did you say? Same topic. Same topic, nice. Keith. So I think it's important to differentiate between a title and a role. You know, I, I, and, and I, I, this isn't, fundamental to your change you're enacting right now, but I think it's really important. And I think we, we did the same thing and we got rid of the whole, we don't call it QA, we don't QA things, why didn't we QA this enough? You know, we, we test things. And I think for the testers themselves, even though you say, yeah, I hire test engineers, well then call them that. You know what I mean? I think, and words, I agree with Paul, words matter a lot priming your environment and making sure you're, you know, people, what they take away from how you talk about what you do is absolutely essential to changing the culture or in, in accepting that. I, I, I fundamentally believe you should call it the test team and not the QA team. Yeah, so let me clarify two things. So our team is, happens to be called the quality assurance team. We happen to be called QA managers. All of our testers are actually called software test engineers, different levels. So, yay. So the two positions we have open are software test engineers. Um, one, other, one other thing I want to add to this, because I think this is important. One of the things that we were trying to do with our organization is how do you actually... Keep on talking. How do you actually... When someone asks you, like, what do you do? All right, so if our CEO came up to us and said, what do you do in the organization? I mean, that's a tough thing for a lot of us to ask. So one of the things that we started brainstorming on is if we put it in terms of what our company does. It's, uh, it's something that you can, uh, it's a lot easier to say. And so as a uh, health insurance company, like one of the things that we're toying about with, when someone comes up to us in an organization and says, what, what is it that you guys do? We're toying with the idea of saying something like, we're actually your prenatal OB care doctor of a, you know, trying to uh, go up to a quality release, right? And it's something that people in the organization actually get that's related to what you're actually doing. Okay, um, it's me again. Oh, nice. It's just uh, uh, on my metric here, you said uh, five times in the session that uh, a title is not important to you. Um, but this is the second longest thread, so I think you should take it as feedback that it might be important to others. Uh, yeah. But I nice. totally respect that you don't think it's important. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Well said. Well Mark. said. Well said. I think one of you guys should actually volunteer for a talk next year at CAST about titles. That'd be awesome. Oh, which is actually a good point right now. I just wanted to make sure there is a long session open for lightning talks. So if any of this has inspired you to do a lightning talk on the topic, please do that. Karsten. Yes. I want to hear you. <laughs> Get you on the board. So just one other thing on this is that, you know, I, I think we need to be sensitive to the fact that there is a lot, you know, part of the community that we're dealing with in our, in our, companies usually does not understand testing. There's a lot of misinformation about testing. And so there is the need to educate them properly with words <laughs> that mean something and, and clarify our 
role and set the expectations properly, that we are not assuring quality, furthermore cannot assure quality, and therefore I think there is a need to adjust our role and the expectation for mothers upon us. Otherwise, they're just going to fill in the blank themselves with confusion and wrong expectations. I'd say yes, and I hope it's more than your title that's going to actually have that conversation. It is. I mean, so that's where the important piece is. But why start with the wrong thing? Okay. Oh, another one. Really? So, new, new topic. Oh. Thank you. Um, in my experience, a lot of times when companies say they want to transform, what they really mean is they want to cut costs. Hmm. And then the immediate next step is, well, let's outsource as opposed to actually looking at, well, how do we become more efficient? Um, so I'm curious as to whether that kind of discussion ever came up, and if so, what you may have done about it. Yeah, our, our, our discussion has not been about cutting costs. It's about making sure we're spending our time on the right things. Um, and so our big focus is about efficiency, making sure we're as lean as we can, cutting out the waste in our, uh, our whole cycle, not about necessarily cutting costs and minimizing the amount of people we have. In fact, we've actually been growing quite a bit. So we have about five minutes left. Any other questions? That's all I ha have on that, those threads. Okay. Did, did we finish the other thread that you wanted to be on, which I can't remember what it was now? Everything. Okay. 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 Everything was exhausted. Okay. So back you. to titles. No. <laughs> Stop. <laughs> Thank you.